Aha! Yes! Bang on time. Well, maybe a few seconds over. Uh, we are live. How are you guys? I hope you are all well and I hope that you uh, all join us in, uh, in a couple of minutes when we have uh, Jack Goff, who will, be, um, who will be our guest tonight on Nevermind the Ballast. How cool is that? Um, there he is, actually. Let's get him involved. Let's press view. Go live with Jack Goff. So we wait. And what happens? Does he turn up waiting for Jack Goff racing? Um, right, he's connecting. Here we go. Oh, my word. Here he is, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> um, first things first, can here you hear go. me? Yes, I can. Oh, this is great. I'm at the telephone because my Wi-Fi is so great. Oh. oh, mate. Well, to be fair, it's a bit... It's a bit uh, delayed, but I reckon we'll get through it, mate. It's a what's going on then? Are you, are you with um, Virgin Broadband or something? No, I live in the middle of a field, um, and basically I've got a hamster in the garden that I haven't sparked up today. So, yeah, we're having to make do with a bit of... I think it's 2G. I don't think it's even 3G, if there is such a thing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's all right. We're making do. But if I've got... Someone told me last time I had a one pixel head. So I'm just like one thumbprint. <laughs> <laughs> Not like your team boss, Tony Gillen, with a thumb head. Uh, he is on this video as well, apparently. So, thumb head, I didn't say that. That was uh, all you. Don't you worry about him, mate. I'll knock him out in a fight. Yeah. Hey, have you seen what I look like? I look like a cross between Alfie Moon from EastEnders and Ace Ventura. I was going to say, you've gone fully out for tonight's uh, fancy dress costume, haven't you? There's a thong, I reckon, make a real effort tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was, was going to go for the Hawaiian shirt and full hat, but, you know, I thought I'd better represent and all that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Listen, first then, how, how the devil are you? What's been occurring? Um, you know, a bit different for everyone, I suppose, but what about yourself? What's been going on? Yeah, um, obviously it's not easy for anybody, um, obviously mainly you, because you've been out on your push bike, which I know is probably absolutely savage for you, um, <laughs> but it's, it's all right, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's different, isn't it? It's different for everybody, obviously massive respect to everybody who's out there working, NHS people, care homes, um, delivery drivers, the whole lot, supermarkets, you know, we wouldn't be surviving without those guys, so thank you very much. I do like my food, so it's important I do get to go shopping every few weeks. That's a good thing. Um, but I've just been busy around the house, to be honest. Keep up to date with sponsors. So Candio Vision, one of my sponsors, they do a Zoom quiz every week. So I am useless at quizzes. I mean, horrendous. I've come last every time. General knowledge obviously isn't my strong point. Um, <laughs> and apart from that, do you know what? Today, I shoveled five tonne. If, if anyone else is watching this who was helping me, then it was all me. Um, I shoveled five tonne of stones from the side of my house in a wheelbarrow all the way down to the end. And uh, I leveled them all out with a rake as well. So obviously I mean, I've got like blisters on my hands, <laughs> manual labor. <laughs> Actually five tonne. How did you figure, how did you figure that? Have you like, is it a full skip or something? Do you know what? I'll put a, a picture of the five tonne bags on my Instagram story after this, just so you're not lying. Um, <laughs> But yeah, five ton bags of rice at 7.30 this morning and my body clock, I don't know about you, but my body clock is shot to bits. It's, it's awful. I, I'm up till 4am on Netflix watching rubbish and then I don't get out of bed till about 10 o'clock in the morning, go out on my push bike, do a few chores around the house and that's about me done. <laughs> do you know, you say that about your body clock and stuff. It's been weird for me because this is the best sleep I've ever had because I think that because I'm in so many different countries with work, my body clock's never the same, you know, it's always a bit of a nightmare. And then I've been going to bed at like half nine, 10 o'clock and getting up at eight or half seven because the, I haven't got any blinds in my house. It's a new account. <laughs> so like we may drop the, like an iPad thing off, not what I'm on now, but one of them eye shield things. And uh, honestly, uh, it, my sleep has just been the best ever. So I'm on top four, mate. So Are you I'm, sure I'm that wasn't like a mark? I've been playing golf. What, like a rock rock? No, like yeah, it's a... not an eye mask, it's for your face. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? Because it's got like this horrible like piece of wire across the top, <laughs> which that must have to go over the nose. <laughs> oh, <laughs> think, dear. I've... So what about work? What, what are you doing? I've been there. Uh, do you know, I've, um, it's been a weird one for me because I've just been doing, like you were saying, I've been on the bike a lot. Um, 
and I think, you know, for, for me, keeping, and I want to speak to you about this as well, just keeping yourself like sharp mentally. Um, I think it's easy to, because the days are just so repetitive and, it, and there's not massive amounts happening and like you're trying to keep busy and stuff. The thing for me is to be outside and try to, you know, on my bike, I've been doing an hour, hour and a half on my bike just every day, just trying to be, um, you know, as productive as I can be and, and just as healthy. Because if I'm not healthy in my mind, it's hard work, mate. And that, that's, it's one thing I was going to ask you about, actually. A few, obviously, British touring cars, a lot of people think it's, it, you don't have to be that physically fit. But I found that if you can find a bit more of a percentage of fitness, it makes your, your brain easier to operate when you're racing. So is that what you've been doing, trying to keep fit, or are you just shoveling loads of rubbish into the skip? <laughs> Obviously, that's where... Um... Oh, oh, sorry. Um, just getting that. I've moved my camera back a bit, you know, so I can get the full... Oh, yeah, anyway. Um... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I've been out on my bike a lot as well. So obviously I spoke to you about bikes, obviously getting tips from the pro himself, uh, Chris Hoy, not you. Um, but yeah, I've been out there on my bike doing about an hour or so, not quite as hardcore as you, but I have got a mountain bike. So it's more difficult on a mountain bike than a road bike. You've got one of these fancy ones, haven't you, with the little skinny tyres? And... Well, I have. I've got, look, mine's like, uh, my, my, my racing bike's like a Ferrari compared to you, like, driving a Clio Cup car with treading tread <laughs> tyres on it. <laughs> it's a funny story. I actually got off with my old <laughs> Clio Cup car, the one I won the championship in the other day. I mean, I'm going a bit off topic here, but, yeah, I got offered that no the other day. Yeah, yeah. I would love to get what, it back. The 2012 one? Yeah, yep. No. And, That'd um, be cool. I what would you do? drove it. What would you do if you got it? Just look at it. That's about it, really. I wouldn't be able to afford to put any petrol in it, so i just look at it every night. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going back to your question about uh, keeping fit and that, yeah, I think you're right. In touring cars, there's such small margins in between everybody on the grid, you know, at Silverstone or something like that. There might be seven tenths of a second covering the whole grid. So I think if you can be mentally prepared, like a little bit more, and you think that, oh, you know, I'm at the top of my level of fitness or somewhere near it, obviously, not the absolute peak. Um, depending on where it is in the season, if it's pre-season, the first few rounds, we might be like right sharp. Um, then I think it will help you a little bit, even if it's half a tenth, something like that. I think these little tiny bits all add up in a, in a British touring car grid. And qualifying is so, so key these days because, because the grid's so close and everyone's tight on lap times, it can be quite difficult to make up places. So... Ideally, everybody wants to be qualifying on the front, I don't know, three to four rows to really give yourself a shot in the first two races. If not, then sometimes what you do is you flip it round and you look at race three where you're looking for a reverse grid. So there's sort of two different angles to go at a race weekend these days. It's you either go fully out, qualifying, you do well and you do well in race one and two. Or if you're carrying ballast or maybe you haven't got the outright pace at some tracks, you know, we have good tracks and we have bad tracks in each car. And if it's a track that doesn't suit us, maybe we'll hopefully get through a few little incidents in race two, get in the top 12. It's 12 still, isn't it? For reverse grid. And, um, you know, reverse grid, we'll get our elbows out and it's anybody's then, you know, what touring cars are like yourself. It's, you've got to get past you, haven't you? To start with. It's, it's a difficult shout, isn't it? With um, like the fitness thing. Cause you know, no disrespect to some of the drivers, but, well, I think, the, I think the game's changed since I've been in it. Um, you know, I remember when I left in 2011, it looked like everyone started to take it a bit more seriously. Like the fitness bar had, had, had been raised. And I think one of the people was probably Colin Turkington, who I've noticed, who really looks sharp even now. He's the same age as me. I look 70 and he still looks about 20. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, he is properly on it. And I think that... You know, those cars, are they're heavier than when I used to drive them, but they've always had power steering. But still, you know, when you get halfway through a race and it's hot and you're just thinking, oh, and you've got someone all over the back here. And it's that little mistake that you make because you just, you just mentally start to tire, don't you? You've got to keep on top of the game, haven't you, really, in anything you race? Yeah, definitely. Um, and going back to the small margins, some cars have electric windows that will open. So... Obviously, they open if they're electric, but you can do it yourself. Um, so if a safety car comes out or, say, a green flag lap, you can drop the windows down. Now, my Honda had that. So on the out laps, 
or if a safety car came out, I could drop the window to just allow some of the, the temperatures to come out of the car because we're at over 50 degrees inside the car. And I think that's the key thing. When the sweat starts going in your eyes and you, know, you can't see and it's, it's difficult, you know, sometimes to even breathe because of the temperature in the car. And these are my driver excuses, by the way. I've got plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> You've got my book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. You know, as a safety car comes out, you go on the radio to your engineer and you're like, how, how long's left? And he's like, oh yeah, there's, there's 17 laps of Snetterton 300 to go and you've got Rob Collard on your bumper. You're like, brilliant. Can't <laughs> see, there's sweat coming out of my eyes and you've got Collard coming at you. <laughs> With his headlights flashing flat out. <laughs> he had him stuck on. What do you think about that? Actually, what do you think about the headlight flashing thing? I remember having to defend Ash Sutton because someone had a right go at him on the internet saying, oh, it's, you know, it's putting people off. It's, it's this and it's that. But I just thought it was part of the game when I drove. I've expected people to put their headlights on and I expected it, you know, to try and, um, you know, unsettle you. Well, mate, you live in Liverpool, so you probably do that on the street as well, <laughs> the traffic lights. I come up. The lights are blue, mate, that flash in my <laughs> um, Do you know what? I've got a funny story about this. I like cream egg. Um, <laughs> going back <laughs> to my first ever podium, so this is 2013, uh, with Team Hard in the Vauxhall Insignia. It was hammering down with rain, brand Satch GP, last race of the day, getting dark. Now, Did you? On. So well, obviously the headlights were on, mate. It was raining and it was dark. Um, so you need them to see. Um, but obviously they were on. Then I started flashing. I was catching Gordon Shedden. You know, I was a kid at this point. And I was like, oh my God, I'm catching the champion. What's going on? And I got all giddy and started pressing my headlights, flashing them at him. Anyway, I got a, I got a direct message from him about four hours after that race. And it was something along the lines of, congrats on your podium, mate. But um, don't flash me again, mate. That trick don't work or something in touring cars. And I'll never forget it, but I still flash everybody when I'm behind them. Just, <laughs> just that, you know, I think it's a natural reaction. It's just, come on, mate, I'm coming through. Uh, you know, I'm coming, I'm coming. Don't hold me up, oh, please. I love that. It's like, it's, like, it's like when you're on a javelin track day or something and someone's <laughs> flashing. And you're with Do you your, know what? I, I will never moan about having to get in the passenger seat of a race car again. I want to go to a track and do some instructing work. You know, put me on a manufacturer job anywhere. I'll do 500 customers in a day. <laughs> so everyone out there who's watching uh, tonight, uh, one, a big thank you. I mean, this is the most people we've ever had watching, so this is cool. Um, two, I think it's wicked we've got Jack to come and have a chat with us. But three, if people don't know, um, me and Jack have done a lot of work together and some of that work has just been like horrendous, isn't it, mate? And talk us through a day like, you know, of what we, we do, because people just think you get paid 1.8 million pounds to race for Team Hard. I, mean, I do, um, but I love going around in circles so much that I strap myself in a race car, passenger seat, and uh, get thrown around by a 14 Geneta Junior sometimes, you know, it's just the things I like to do. Um, jokes, by the way, I don't get paid 1.8 million if Tony's listening still. Um, but it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's different every day, isn't it? This is the thing. It's some days you'll be instructing in a race car. Uh, another day you might be at a manufacturer job at Millbrook of all places. You know, you turn up and if you're not hating your day already at seven o'clock in the morning, going to the Millbrook crew room, you then turn up and you see Paul O'Neill with his face pressed against the glass of the door. And it's like, what is, what have I done to deserve this? <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be glamorous with this touring car racing, but. All jokes aside, you know, we all moan about our jobs. Everyone does, but it's a great bunch of people usually we have working on these jobs and we can have a good laugh, can't we? And we get through it. And yes, you have bad days, you have good days. Sometimes you have a day you get strapped into a car on, I don't know, a Vauxhall Corsa launch maybe. There's other brands available, obviously. And you can tell, can't you, within, well, before you even get out of the pit lane, what your customer's going to be like. It is flat out. And he's looking at you directly in the eyeballs going, sorry if I scare you. Sorry if I scare you. You're like, mate, I've been on a night out with Paul O'Neill. This will not scare me. Trust me. I've seen his dance moves. <laughs> this will be nothing like bouncing off the rev limit to going into church in 99th gear. That's not <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good though, isn't it? Like I say, we get to travel a lot. You travel a lot more than me because obviously you're the famous one and they pick you more. Um, but it's, it's good. It sounds really glamorous from the outside. You know, I do a lot of work with Rolls Royce. You do lots with McLaren. Um, but we do do some long days. And yes, we're strapped into cars doing 190 mile an hour sometimes. It's, 
you know, you, you do take your life obviously into your own hands sometimes. Yeah, do you know, it's a good point, actually. And, you know, I've had a pop at a couple of people on the internet when I shouldn't. And that's basically just defending us guys as, as jobs. You know, we've had, we've had friends killed in d doing our job, haven't we? And it is dangerous at the end of the day, and, but needs must. And, you know, it, it's a great job. And, but sometimes it's dangerous. It's like racing a car, isn't it? You, you know, you, you do it because you love it. And it is dangerous. And that's one of the, the things that we do. And we help a lot of kids out. And, um, yeah, it, it can be quite a difficult thing, can't it? But we, I think the interesting part for me is, you know, you mentioned about me with my face squashed up against the thing and greeting everyone. I only get employed for these jobs to just keep morale high. <laughs> <laughs> it, all jokes aside, it does make a massive difference, doesn't it? When you've got a good group of you working on a job and you all get on, you have a bit of a laugh, you know, we moan about the crew room food sometimes, things like that. But actually, when you've got a good bit of banter between the group of lads, it makes a massive difference. Go back to the hotel, have one drink maybe, or 12, um, to get through the day. But it is good. <laughs> and obviously, going back to earlier on, I said, I think there's a few people from Candio Vision in this chat I've seen pop up. And they know how bad I am at quizzes. So if it wasn't for the racing element and instructing, I'd probably be pretty screwed because I wasn't going to get a job in government or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, listen. That's what one of my things was I was going to ask you about. Um, you know, I remember you... Uh, I remember you on the scene in, in, in the Toka Paddock uh, ooh, 2010 in the Clio Cup. You and know your stuff. I remember... Yeah, I'm a bit of a nerd, mate. Um, I remember you coming on the scene and one, I remember thinking, he's the most handsome man I've ever seen race a car. I would <laughs> like to touch his face. You the other thing was... <laughs> The other thing was, Phil Blue was saying, you know, this lad's pretty good. He's come from MG Trophy. Um, this will be a real test for him. It was a test, wasn't it, in, in 2010 and 11? But I remember you winning your first race, actually. That must have been, that was 2011 at Alton Park, I think, because I was in a Chevy Cruze, and I remember watching the race, because I always used to watch the race to see how fast the red lights go out. And you won your first race. And I, I just remember your car crossing the line, and it had so many stickers on it, mate. I was like, grow up, just paint it black. And I'm done. <laughs> you had six million. Like, how important is it to have the sponsors? And I know the answer to this, but how important now is it to assure them, you know, that we're going to be sound and we're going to go racing? Because that, that's a serious question, really, mate. First of all, the car was black, but you just couldn't see it because there's so many logos over the top of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it, it was difficult. I don't come from a wealthy background myself so my mum and dad obviously cashed their pension in i've said this a few times for my first race car which was the mg trophy car that we spoke about um so yeah i do still owe them for that um obviously i'm not working at the minute though so i can't pay them back um but that aside obviously sponsorship is absolutely key because of this i don't pay for it through family budget things like that and there's not the money really in the manufacturers currently that are going to go and put millions of pounds into a, a touring car team unfortunately I, I hope it comes back obviously i always said i grew up in the wrong era because having been teammates of alan menu and heard, heard the money he was earning back in the day whew, I'm doing all right right now we're doing all right <laughs> um but going back to the sponsor bit yeah it, it's key i don't have racing without my sponsors um my personal sponsors you know i mentioned them earlier candio vision um champion rv uh tz welding you know i've got a lots of my own individual ones i haven't got as many as i used to have um for different reasons you know people fall out of love sometimes with sport they have different marketing budgets things like that um but then also the team so team hard tony gillam he does brilliantly as well at bringing people on board and between us we make it work we're not saying we've got the biggest budget on the grid but team hard are a massive massive family team and you know we all group together rcib insurance They've got on board um, Fox Transport. Everyone joins in and uh, no one gives up trying to find sponsors as well because at the end of the day, I'm not taking a holiday off the sponsorship. We'll do more testing. You know, there's never a such thing as having too much budget because you can always go and do more pre-season. You can afford to put more brakes in your car. You can put more tyres in the car and testing. So, yeah, it is key. It's a massive part of it. And I think certainly currently with the way the world is, You've really got to look after your sponsors, not just at the weekends, but also away from the track as well. And that's a massive point. It's one thing getting a sponsor, 
it's another thing keeping them every year because there's plenty of other drivers out there who want them and you know it's important you look after them that's is interesting mate and i i would you know listening to to you say that i would always want to see it for myself and i have seen firsthand and people a lot of people won't know this but i've worked with you on jobs and i remember three years ago or something like that we were on a job in birmingham and we used to have 20 minute a 20 minute break in the morning and a 20 minute break in the afternoon and then like 40 minutes lunch and I always used to, used to find you in the crew room with your laptop open, like putting, you know, uh, a sponsor that you might have or trying to, you know, speak to or a partner you try and speak to, sticking their sticker on, on the race car that you had at the time. And it was only three or four rounds in. And I don't know anyone else that works as hard as you do to, to keep racing. I mean, uh, has anyone ever tried to help you out or, you know, have you always done it off your own back because you know what, you you want and you know what maybe a sponsor wants um, as a return on investment um i used to have somebody that helped me um you helped me a lot and sort of taught me the ropes um i i come i taught myself photoshop things like that but you're right you know it's sometimes we'll be away on a long job and budgets are always tight you know you can get damaged at a race weekend things like that and we might be on a, a two or three week job we don't have any days off so any moment you can get to put a proposal together is absolutely key so i do it from the ground up from the initial contact with the company or the director or the the person who holds the purse strings usually is the person i'm trying to find so if i get in touch with that person obviously packages can start from such a small amount of budget all the way up to a full uh team sponsor you know headline sponsor so you've always got to be quite bespoke with it uh set it up for the individual needs of each each different sponsor um and like I say, I do it from the livery design to looking after them on race weekends. We used to do our own hospitality uh, in 2018 and 17. So that was all done through family and things like that. So my nan and granddad even got involved. I got them working. You know, you can't leave anyone slacking. Um, <laughs> so we have everyone involved. And, you know, we used to set the hospitality on and up on a Thursday, um, race Saturday, Sunday. I used to do the cooking. So my dad would cook some dishes. I would cook some dishes that would then get given to the guests, obviously, Saturday, Sunday. So if anyone complains on here about the food, it was all <laughs> my dad's side. Um, and, you know, sometimes you could have awful weekends. I remember a weekend at Notkill. I think it was 2017. We were doing well in the championship. And I think it was race, race two. We had a DNF. We got tagged coming out the hairpin. And, I mean, race three, Notkill, you know what it's like. It can be carnage sometimes. And I think we came 12 for something. But you then got to go and pack the awning down. So it was 9 p.m. We started packing the awning down. It took about four or five hours to do that. And then I had to drive back from Notkill because I had a flight to San Francisco for a job the very next morning at 7 a.m. from Heathrow. So it's not all glamorous, but I think it gives you that better relationship with your sponsors if you can do it yourself sometimes. And do you know what? I enjoy it. I like the whole the challenge of going out there, finding sponsors, putting the package together, going to visit them, presenting it to them, and hopefully landing them so that we can go race them. That's the most important bit for, for obviously, the drivers. Amazing, mate. I love it. I, I, I can't, you know, I've always been pretty fortunate with the sponsors that we've had. I've always covered the whole cost if it's been, a, you know, one or two sponsors. Um, and, and that's always been great. But trying to find, you know, I've been there before when, you, you know, you're going from weekend to weekend to race. And you only know on the Wednesday before, this is like in 2009, and it's like, oh, you're trying to find that extra 2,000 or 3,000 pounds. And it's, uh, that's one thing I admire, mate, about your, your motivation is second to none, absolutely second to none. And what is it that motivates you? Do you want to, you know, obviously everybody wants to be champion. You've got to believe that you can be. You've won five touring car races. You know, it, it's got to be, it's got to be up there, isn't it, that you can win the championship. And do you see that coming? Because you're still a young lad, aren't you? Well, I don't know if I'd still be classed in Alan Hyde's Young Chargers anymore. I always remember at the start of the year, he always introduces people on media day like, here's the <laughs> champions, here's the, uh, the challengers, and here's the Young Chargers. I'm not sure if I still get into that category. I'm 29, so I'm not quite 30 yet. So maybe that's the, the switchover point. But I, I think at the end of the day, it's the passion for it, the passion for racing. I always grew up watching touring cars. That was a massive dream of mine. Even the Clio Cup Championship was a massive dream and it always seemed so far away from me because, you know, we, we scrimped and scraped to do karting. It, you know, we didn't have the budgets to go and run with a massive, massive team in karting. You know, people were spending fortunes doing that. 
but we, we as a family team, you know, I, I raced with a family team and they helped us out. And that sort of gives you that hunger for it. And, you know, having to work for it sometimes makes you more hungry for it, I think. And certainly, obviously, the championships, everyone's dream. I'm living my dream already doing touring cars. I love it. I, I enjoy every weekend. I still love it. Uh, I still get butterflies the night before, you know, that excitement feeling. So, yes, I can't imagine what it'd be like if I was British touring car champion. I can pretty, put my finger on it, it'd be pretty good. I could probably ask Colin. He's got enough of a money. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he'd probably give me one, actually. I mean, come on. He's, he's hogging him a little bit. He should share them out, shouldn't he? And talking about getting butterflies and stuff, I think you get quite a lot of butterfly chicken, don't you, before uh, a race weekend at Nando's? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been pretty savage, this whole lockdown situation, but having known Nando's is pretty bad. I did see people starting to do, like, pick-up collections and things like that, so I've had to uh, resort to making my own Nando's. I've been doing a lot of barbecues. Just basically, you know, like a typical English person. As soon as the sun comes out, I mean, I'm looking out the window right now thinking, I mean, it's barbecue weather. It's about 10 degrees, but the sun is out. I've got shorts ready. I'm good to go. I've got, I've got a ring doorbell at home and the motion sensor's always going off. And I, I have to look through just to see what people are wearing, just so I know when I get out my wardrobe open, should I wear shorts today? And then I look on the app, it's like 11 degrees and there's, your man's walking down flip-flop shorts on <laughs> down to the Tesco Express on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Costa del Widness. <laughs> yeah, Costa del Widnay, mate. It's mega. <laughs> oh, dear. But, you know, you know, Tony Gillam, actually. So you started racing with, with uh, Tony Gillam and Team Hard uh, in 13. And, and I said, I, I, remember, I remember interviewing you because somebody was missing out the presenting team. I can't remember. And I interviewed you. And I remember your windscreen wipers were all crossed up. They weren't working. And, you know, you got to the end of that race amazingly. But... You're back with Tony. How instrumental has, has Team Hard been? And they've been very good to a lot of drivers, to be fair. And I've driven for Tony, um, and I've got nothing but respect. He's got the same passion, hasn't he, as, as, as yourself to go racing? Yeah, I remember in 2012, it was the year I won the Clio Championship. He, um, he came to me about halfway through the year and was like, look, if you win the championship, I'll give you a test in a touring car. And I was like, whoa, this is good. Um, obviously gave that even bigger hunger to go out there and win it. And fair play to Tony, he kept his word. It was Silverstone, it was November, it was uh, well, a typical British pre-season test in the winter, really. It was rainy, cold, freezing. It was, it was disgusting. But obviously getting my first drive in a touring car was, was the icing on the cake, really. And from that point onwards, you know, I knew I wanted to always do touring cars, but that made it even hungrier. And we spoke to Tony, we kept in touch. I spoke to all my sponsors, he spoke to his sponsors, and we managed to get a deal where we got onto the grid in 2013 in the uh, the Team Hard Insignia. Obviously, at the end of that year, we got the podium uh, when I was flashing Gordon, and got told off. <laughs> um, <laughs> never forget that one. I might still have it in my D DMs, actually. I'll have to have a look through, <laughs> won't I? Um, I'm pretty sure he's not watching, so, you know, it's all right. Um, he won't be watching, mate. He hates me. <laughs> and obviously... <laughs> Getting that podium sort of kicked us on to the next year as well. Uh, the following year was a weird one. That's when it was Team BMR slash Team um, Hard. Um, but I was still in the insignia for the first half of the year. And then the second half of the year, we got put into a VW. We then went our separate ways. We went into the MG uh, in 2015, which is obviously another massive uh, tick in the box for me because obviously it's a manufacturer drive. You've obviously been with Triple Eight yourself, a very professional team. And that's got me my first win in touring cars, which I'll never forget. But yeah, coming back into, it was the end of, what was it, 2018. We had a really good year with the Honda again, with the uh, Wix Racing Honda. And I think up until the last weekend, we were able to win the championship still. And we went into race two, I think fourth in the championship, fifth in the championship. And we was catching Dan Camish for the lead. And then I still blame Matt Simpson for this. He'd had a bit of a shunt with someone going onto the GP loop. And we'd just got onto the back of Dan Camish's bumper. And he ran over a bit of debris and it went straight through my grill, went through my radiator and within one straight, the engine oh, had... Not through not your grill, you're free your front grill. I can't wear my uh, grill when I'm racing, mate. That's only on jobs. On out, out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just unfortunate, this bit of debris came up off the back of his car and went straight through my radiator and within one straight, well, we had a massive hole in the engine like that. And that was the, uh, pretty much game over. And 
that would have put us P2 or P3 in the championship. And we only had to score like one point in the last race to get a top two or top three in the championship. And who knows what would have happened. But that put me about a drive because obviously Jeff and Eurotech ended, um, which was unfortunate. I then lost the Wicks back in. Um, obviously, the Brexit situation came about. This, we've got loads of excuses, haven't we? But um, Brexit came about and that put a stop to the Wicks budget. Um, and then, yeah, I had no drive. That was it. And I mean, the 11th hour is probably a bit of an understatement. Tony Gillum got on the phone and I was like, oh, what does he want if he's still watching? He's going to be <laughs> asking me for something. It's probably a bill I own from 2013 still. Um, <laughs> but he got on the phone to me and he's like, um, yeah, I want you to drive our car. And I was like, oh, what? VW Cup car? Ginetta? He's like, no, no, a touring car. And I was like, mate, it's, it's media day tomorrow. Like tomorrow. He's like, yeah, yeah, we need you to come down to the workshop now and have a seat fitting. So I went to the workshop down in Kemp, got there, sat in the car, put it into the truck. And the first time I ever started it was the sighting laps for the media day the very next day. So I've got massive, massive respect for Tony, for Team Hard, the morals. Obviously, it's a family run team, uh, very much like myself. You know, I've come from a family atmosphere. So it, it works. The sponsors love it. Uh, Tony gets involved with the sponsors. It's very much that family atmosphere and hospitality. So it, it ticks all the boxes. And, you know, it's his commitment, his passion makes a massive difference. It's amazing, isn't it? And this would be your 11th year um, racing when we get on the way in, in, in the Tolka paddock. And that there's not many people um, who are not paying out of their own pocket to, to be doing that within the whole of the Tolka paddock. And I just, I find it astounding, mate. I really do. And I thought that's why you'd be a brilliant guest um, tonight. And, a lot of people saying, actually, a lot of people asking. I did see one question come through, and it said, um, uh, would you ever consider being on ITV Sport if, you know, you, you weren't racing uh, in the years to come and, uh, and and being with the presenting team of, um, well, we'll get rid of Addison or someone because no one likes him, but would you do it? Um, I'd put in a request that if you weren't there, then, yeah, I'd probably do it, but I wouldn't share a room with you, <laughs> mate. You, you, you borrowed my pants <laughs> once, but that's about as far as it goes. Oh my word, yeah, no, I did, I borrowed your kecks. But they were like, they were Calvin Klein's. I remember I washed them and you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> you, no, mate, no, no, I did believe you because you washed them in your hotel sink while showing me with your hands. <laughs> if anyone wants the video, the I do still have it. <laughs> I'll save right the there. five. No, <laughs> mate, I was no way going to pay about 18 quid just for a pair of boxer shorts to be cleaned anyway. That's when we were playing football, wasn't it? Oh my god. You way. did actually hey, listen, we, some good we went shopping for him. We went shopping for some pants. And you that's when you turned around oh, and said, I ain't paying that. I'm gonna borrow yours. <laughs> so it was. <laughs> I had all my socks and everything like hung up around the where the I took the pictures off the wall in the hotel and hung me bo <laughs> your boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, I'm a grown I'm four years of age. I'm a terrible man. My word. Hey listen. Look. There's loads of people here asking questions. Let me have a quick look. Um, Tony Gillum, hero. Grow up, mate. He's not that much of a hero. Uh, <laughs> He's not about you, mate. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, I am. Respect. Um, Jack, this is from Andrea. Um, Jack, your 2019 win was the best I've ever seen screaming at the TV. I don't remember you screaming at the TV, Jack. Um, I was. One, of, <laughs> mate, one of the best things I've ever seen. I was sat in, um, in Alan Gow's uh, bus in, in Toka watching it. And you and Moffitt coming through, um, oh, mate, unreal. Did I hear right that your dad kind of had a bit of a say in the tyre choice uh, coming in early for the wets? Has he paid you to say that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, honestly, I heard, I heard it. Was, it was paddock. It was a paddock rumour. Um, so in race two, um, we did something similar. And then they threw the red flag out. So at that point, I was fuming because... We were coming through at like five or six seconds a lap faster and we had about 10 laps to go. So I was like, we're on for something good here. I didn't think we were going to win it, but I thought we might get top five, something like that, which would have been great. Um, but they threw the red flag out and I think we were like 20th at that point. But like I say, we was coming through really fast. Um, so I was annoyed. And then race three came about. Like I say, I think I started 25th, maybe somewhere around there. And it was the green flag lap and was going onto the, the national trip. I think it's called out the back. And going down towards the BRDC clubhouse, there was like a little mist in the air. And I saw like over the back of the grandstands, there were some black clouds coming. I came over the radio and I was just like, boys, what do you reckon? It's a bit dark. It's a bit dark overhead. So we, so we give it a go. And 
I think I had a problem with my radio and they were like, what would you say? And I was like, it's dark, should we come in? Obviously Silverstone being a short lap as well. We didn't have time to really communicate that much. I was, I was one corner from the pit lane. And they were like, well, it's up to you, mate. It's up to you. And I was like, I'm in the pits. It's wet, it's wet, it's wet. And they're like, can you repeat? I was like, I can see you. I'm in the pits. Get these wets on. Let's go. Um, but yeah, my dad apparently did say, I think he came over the radio, or didn't come over the radio, but he said to the boys, yeah, let's just do it. So um, I think he's taking credit for that one. He just put a, a little emoji down the bottom, like a thumbs up or something. So I, I'll give him like 20% of that. I, I made the original call, but he just, from the pit lane, was like, yeah, go for it. Give it a go, boy. <laughs> but it was good. That is, it, uh, you never lose that will to want to win, and you know that winning feeling is always amazing. Doesn't matter how many times you've done it, I don't think you always want to win, and it still feels amazing. But getting out of the car and seeing what it meant to Tony, the team, the family, the extended family, which are called the sponsors, things like that. The garage was absolutely rammed, and you know Silverstone garages are massive. But this garage from wall to wall was absolutely rammed. And I remember Alan Hyde saying it wasn't like a touring car garage. The noise coming out of it was like a football ground when obviously not Liverpool winning because they're not allowed to win because it's banned and they're going to cancel the premiership. But when obviously <laughs> Arsenal, the best team in the, win, in the world, score or win the uh, premiership, it was like that. It was like that atmosphere. You know, it's brilliant. I, I loved it. And seeing what it meant to them meant a lot to me as well. Oh, mate, I remember it. It was brilliant. And it, like you say, when you, when you get a sniff of a win, your motivation is still... And that just shows the killer instinct, doesn't it? You know, of what you need in British touring cars. It must have been amazing. And what was the radio chatter like um, on the, <laughs> the cool down lap? Um, so the best thing is, initially, so I say I had a little bit of a radio problem. I think it had been a wet day, so probably some water got in somewhere. Um, but I remember... Someone came over the radio to me and they were like, oh, um, yeah, you're doing all right. Lap times are good. And I had Ash Sutton in front of me. Now, I didn't know he was a lap down at this point. So I'm there thinking I'm in P2 with Moffat just behind me thinking, oh, Sutton's getting away. I've got to, you know, I've got to go for this. And I, I thought he was leading until about four laps from the end. I didn't have a clue. Oh. So I'm chasing down Sutton, trying to keep it on the track just about, just trying to keep up with him. Um, and they were like, no, 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 it's all good. You're leading. And I was like, what? I'm leading? Happy days. I was happy with P2, let alone winning this thing. But the, the worst thing was, I think with about 10 laps to go, the windscreen header strip flew off, and which you saw on the TV footage as well. And um, obviously, I think it was it last year or the year before, they introduced the holes down to the roll cage where they picked the car up from an accident. And yeah. um, they're behind the windshield on the VW. So the windscreen header flew off which led to massive holes in the windscreen, which I was like in a hot tub, basically, water flying in. And it steamed fully up. I mean, I couldn't see a thing out of the windscreen. The side windows were gone. Obviously, like I say, the VW hasn't got windows to open. And there was a 50p piece hole down by the wing mirror. And I was basically driving through that hole, like seeing where the curb was and going, right, I know I've got a break at this point, bloody blah, blah. And uh, I was just saying to the boys <laughs> on the radio, look, just keep me updated on lap times from the guys behind because... You know, I'll have to push on a little bit if I need to or back it off so I don't lob it off into the kitty litter or something. Mate, I remember seeing you. I remember coming down to Park Fair, mate, and shaking your hand, saying, well done. And I looked in your car and it looked like someone had replaced your windscreen with a Brillo pad. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I was going to bring my cooker down and get it cleaned. <laughs> uh, I mean, it literally, like, obviously... Touring cars or any race cars are never the best sealed up things because at the end of the day, they're all stripped back. There's no line in them, things like that. So the boys do the best job they can do, but it always steams up. You know, we get the old fairy liquid out and start rubbing it on the windscreens, but there's only a certain amount you can do with it. And that wasn't on our side that day. I just couldn't see a thing. And I was just hoping there's about one lap to go and there's 10 laps to go, unfortunately. <laughs> hey, listen, we've just had a, a horrendous southerner turn up, mate. Creasy's just turned up. Um, giving it the large one here, saying, P9, baby, don't worry about him winning. Um, God, what was it like having him as a teammate? Was that hard work? Because he, to be fair, he's one of the first people over to you, isn't he? And saying, well done. Nah, I mean, all jokes aside, he was brilliant for team morale. You, you know what he's like. He's, he's happy every day of the week. I think he's the happiest guy when he came 26th. I was, I was like, distraught one of the races. And he was like, don't worry, mate, we're having a great time. And I was like, Fair play, we are having a good time. Um, but no, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I always remember the first race 
of 2019. He came past me on the cool down lap with his leg out of the window, waving with his legs, waving <laughs> with his arms. I think Alan Gow or someone had a go at him saying, mate, you can't be hanging out of the car on your in-laps, you know. <laughs> but he's brilliant, a brilliant character. And, you know, it'd be a loss to the team and a, a great benefit to obviously the Norlin boys. They'll have a, a good laugh of him. And yeah, we'll, we'll have some fun though. We'll have some fun still. Yeah, no, it'd be cool. And you talk, talk about your teammates. Um, you've obviously should have had Bushel, uh, Mike Bushel, but you've got Howard Fuller. He was testing with you in Spain uh, and also Hamilton as well. So Nicholas... Uh, coming on board and you know how impressed now you've seen what Nicholas has to deal with um, are you with, with him because I think he's absolutely awesome to just get in a car mate I mean he has to deal with Howard as well which is also a challenge uh, <laughs> but Howard's brilliant Howard is fantastic again like Michael he is a great asset to the team he's brilliant at bringing the morale up um, he's a really good guy he's fast um, he certainly doesn't leave anything on the table. He likes to go sideways a lot. But yeah, going back to Nick, you know, he's a true inspiration. Um, I didn't know the true extent, obviously, when I wasn't his teammate. And like you say, to see just getting in and out of the car, that's a challenge. The things we take for granted. And he did that 150 steps, I think it was, or climbs up the stairs um, for the NHS. And the guy is a true inspiration, an absolute inspiration. He's one of the smoothest drivers I've seen. I've seen his onboard videos. And... Um, yeah, he's brilliant. He really, really is good. And again, he's just a genuine nice guy and nice guy to have in the team. Um, he's got some cool stories as well. And um, he's great for the team um, for the team image, isn't he? You know, he brings in a big big name sponsors, Monster, he's got on the car. It's not a bad thing. The energy drinks are pretty good as well. So we're going to be buzzing all the way back from Scotland, <laughs> which is good. Good job. Good job, Chris. He's not still there then. Imagine him it'd on be, that. It'd be about 20 cans of Monster down by race one. He'd be like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word actually how much of an engineering challenge is it for the team uh, to set up the, the, the pedals and everything for, for Nick because he has cerebral palsy if people don't know yeah obviously he has a well, he's got two hand clutches I believe in his car it's like a GT3 car I keep telling him mate that your paddle shifts um, <laughs> no wonder you get good starts Nick all the time he's like a rocket ship off the line he's got an <laughs> F1 style paddle um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's different obviously the pedal box is different itself so the um the master cylinders on the brakes are slightly different um but the actual driving style you know is down to the driver and his chassis is exactly the same as mine um but every driver likes their car slightly differently i like a car with lots of front end grip i'd rather it be a little bit over steery than under steery um because obviously especially in a race situation you want it to be looking after its front tires front wheel drive car here's my driver excuse in number 49 um, compared to a rear-wheel drive car, uh, we hurt our tyres a lot more. So we've got to try and look after them. So we make the car uh, a little bit lively and a little bit hard to hold on to for the first five or six laps. And hopefully it'll balance itself out halfway through. But that's no, good. He's good to the team. He brings some good engineering experience. Howard obviously hasn't got quite as much touring car stuff uh, recently. He did drive in 2013, weirdly, with me and Team Hard as well. So we've sort of come back together <laughs> like a, a little family. Um, but he, like I say, he's really quick as well, and he's got a good engineering brain, which obviously helps a lot. And whether Mike's in the car or not, obviously he's a great sort of person to bring into the team as well. He's had a go in the Honda, which I used to drive last year, um, and he's got a bit of engineering experience as well. So I think we're in a good place. You know, we've got a good group of engineers. We've got a great bunch of guys working at the team. Obviously, Tony's passion. Um, I think we're in a good place. Yeah, that'd be good, mate. We've done a, do quite a bit of testing in Spain as well, isn't it? So it's really cool. Hey, listen, I won't keep you much longer, but there was something I wanted to ask you about because uh, I thought it was amazing um, when I when I watched the race and the results you had that weekend, if I remember. Uh, the Diamond Double, you finished second to Matt Neal. You were on pole and you had a great race with Matt. That must have been something fantastic. Racing on the 60th anniversary of British Touring Cars, being on the podium, but then winning the last race of the day. Um, a great weekend. And you've always gone well at Snet. Your first win was there with Triple Eight, obviously, and MG. Yeah, weirdly, it's one of those tracks that's just always worked with me. Uh, even back in Clio's, it seemed to work well. And like you say, uh, in the MG, we had our first win there. And that was probably, I'd say, my most dominant qualifying performance in 2018. Um because there was two qualifiers as well. So qualifying one was the grid for race one. And that was done on ballast, you know, with ballast in the car, which we carried over from the previous weekend. And uh, we was on pole by maybe, I don't know, two temps. 
And I was like, ah, the car's pretty good. And my engineer said to me, I will make a few little tweaks. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's not go crazy here. And we took out the 40 kilos of ballast, made a few little tweaks to it. And I can honestly say it was the best front wheel drive touring car I'd ever driven in that qualifying session. The thing was on absolute <laughs> rail. It was unbelievable, mate. I, I, we only had one run because we had one set of tyres, obviously. And we went out there. And it just kept getting quicker and quicker. And I was like, I'm on lap seven round Sneston, and this car's getting faster. And we was on pole by like half a second, I think. And yeah, I mean, to do it on the Diamond Double weekend was brilliant. Um, shame we didn't get the win. I was more more annoyed about not getting the win when I saw the size of the trophy Matt got. I mean, that was <laughs> yeah. huge. I was fuming. I was like, oh, mate, I would have gone for that. Um, but it started to spit with rain in that race. And we made a little mistake. And I almost went off, actually. I locked up into the first hairpin and Matt got past me. And in the back of my mind, you know, it was a year we were going for the championship and it double points in that race. I couldn't afford to take a risk with Matt and risk having a DNF. So we went for P2. It was a good race. Uh, Tom Ingram was P3, I think. And yeah, great to be involved with. And I, I like racing any touring car races, but the 60th race, obviously, is a uh, 60th year, sorry, is pretty special. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you know what I remember about the, the, uh, the Diamond Double weekend was Steve Ryder off air. And I didn't know this at the time, but there's some old man's cider called Double Diamond. <laughs> you get really saying, welcome back to uh, the Double Diamond TV4 race. I was like that. Oh, we're not live. Oh, I, honestly, I, 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 I was like proper thinking, if he says this, I'm going to laugh. Steve Ryder and, and Tim Harvey were like laughing. But I was like, what's Double Diamond? And then looked on the internet and it's a proper snotty old cider from like 1974. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we're getting some abuse here, by the way. They're saying our um, lockdown haircuts are getting out of control. Um, hey, uh, Sam, Sam happy Holmes. Mind's growing. It's what? <laughs> I'm just happy mine's growing. <laughs> You're going for the big growth. <laughs> <That's... laughs> what did I see before? Someone put something really funny. Where was it? Uh, what's the... <laughs> Jesus Christ. You're getting battered. Hang on. <laughs> I did see one. <laughs> what is it now? What's this? I'm I'm just surprised Paul isn't necking wine already. He's been worryingly professional. That's because <laughs> I've got new employers. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I've got. I'll, I'll end it in a second. But I've got to say um, that what you're going to do with the with the heed? Have you done a fade? Have you had like honestly? Have you fresh Prince of Bel Air? That mate. Hey. Honestly... <laughs> I mean, this is. Me, myself, we bought, I bought some clippers, right? And I was like, how hard can it be? So to start with, obviously, what was it? Eight weeks now of lockdown? Obviously, my hair on the top was a lot shorter at this point. So I got away with it a little bit. But I'm not brave enough to, like, start doing the top. So it's just going, like, it went from a mushroom cut to more of, like, an ice gem. <laughs> I found I fa <laughs> You know what? This is, this is going massively off topic here, but that picture just reminded me of back in the day. Um, I started watching a thing on Netflix, I don't know if I can even say that, um, called The Last Dance. Have you seen it? The um, oh, heard about the it, the Jordan bit. thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's class, that. It's worth it's a watch. Good. Yeah. Oh, I'll, have to, I'll have to have a watch of that, mate. Um, did you know, I was going to say, what have you been watching on Netflix apart from that then? It's a bit, like, it sounds a bit messed up, but I love it like a murder documentary, which is a bit messy, isn't it? Um, what else have I watched? Ah, Race Across the World. Have you seen that? Hey, that's self then. Yeah, I'm getting told what I've been watching. As hey, you know, I, love, I, love, I love the fact that I was imagine if I said, is that self and you've gone, uh, no, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just watching online somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Race Across the I, World, which is BBC where they get like the money, the same amount of money as an airfare and they can't take any air transport, but they can do, that's air, not hair. Um, they can do boats, cars, trains, things like that, or hitchhike. And they have to get like to the other side of the world, basically. So it's worth a watch. Oh, thank oh I'll have to hope. I've, I've not watched anything. Uh, I was going to watch Afterlife, but that I'm just like, I don't want to be any more depressed than I am anyway. Not working. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I've not, um, I've not really switched the telly on. I've been fifa in actually. Have you been flat out on FIFA or not? Uh, do you know what? I was, but I've had a little bit of a break recently, but I do have to still give you a good 
smashing on FIFA at some point. Uh, if my Wi-Fi is good enough, that's my problem. Um, what about... What, oh, our girl. Obviously, Michelle Keegan. What's that? I'm getting a massive look from over here. Our <laughs> girl is, you know, Michelle Keegan. It's oh, when she's in the army. Sorry, the Northerners call that our girl, not ah. our girl. <laughs> <laughs> it's good I love a bit of that nice that <laughs> oh mate hey listen right Jack Goff you have been on for 50 minutes mate and do you know what's amazing about tonight is that I can see and I'm sure you can as well how many people are watching but that's gone actually as high as it's ever been um, tonight so absolutely amazing stuff so obviously word got round that uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air was on um, <laughs> with his head on upside down <laughs> That's his album for his dad's shirt on. What? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. mate. mate. You've been an absolute pleasure. I've loved the stories. I think, you know, loads and loads of positives we can take away from, from that. Because I think a lot of people who watch this, um, they love racing, but some of them may race themselves. And it's great to hear your stories, mate. And I can vouch for every single one of you, uh, your hard sponsorship stories and getting everything together partnership-wise. So good luck to you, lad. Um, and hopefully I'll see you at work sometime. And uh, yeah, all the best, Lid. Thanks for having me, mate. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the questions and the abuse. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>